We've got to be at least 26280. So let's just hope. Happens. Take care of the people. We need help, okay? And stay off the uh, doors. Door here, door there, door there, door there. Okay, you guys, are you listening still? Because we hear a lot of chatter. We have a lot of adult programming here at this library. Never had anything like this before. Um, the, uh, if you pick up a yellow sheet in the back, you see we have a ton of programming here. Wednesday night we have this great, really it's great, about couponing of all things. Thursday night we have a program on uh, African American genealogy, which is really great. Um, and we have other events too. There's a food tasting thing going on next week and other book signings and stuff like that. So that's it. It's very hot in here. Don't talk about the temperature because I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> This is as loud as it goes. You're going to have to turn up your hearing aids. Sorry. So sorry. And uh, that's it. So please welcome the man you came to see, Ed Haslam. Somebody said to me, so why would people hear about a murder 50 years later? I think this is the answer to the question. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is all done to Duke's fault. Where are you done? <laughs> uh, I'm over here. <laughs> there it is. Okay. It's from WWL Radio. He helps me. He has helped me many, many times over the years. Uh, I'll be talking about that. Uh, the first book, back, my really, really, really first book, was Mary Fairy and the Monkey Virus. And that came out in 1995. I could only afford to print a thousand copies, and they were gone pretty quickly. And I just sort of struggled on from there. In 2007, I did the first version of uh, Mary, Dr. Mary's Monkey here, and um, Don put me on the air. And since then, people have been bringing me information. I mean, I spent a lot of time digging for information myself, but since then the game has changed, and radio has been a very important part of this. I was on the Louisiana Radio Network up in Baton Rouge, and we were taking some listener calls, and this guy says, have you ever heard about this woman that lived at the patio apartments who knew Lee Harvey Oswald? Yeah. <laughs> her, her name is Victoria Hawes. I read about her in Joe Mellon's book. And he said, yes, that's right. And I'm a, her ex-husband's brother-in-law. You know, this is real Louisiana stuff. <laughs> and he says, would you like to talk to my brother-in-law? I said, yes. You know, that would be great. And so he puts me in contact with Owen Hawes, Victoria's ex-husband. And within a couple of days, I'm talking to both Owen and Victoria about this. And Victoria went to middle school with Lee Oswald. Now, Lee was in 63, Lee was 23, and she was 21. Okay? And she had just gotten married, and she had a baby at home. And she lived on the second floor of the patio apartments on the downtown side. And they had sliding glass doors in those days. Okay? They've remodeled the building since sliding glass doors. And so one day there's a knock on the door and she goes over to the door and there is Lee Oswald standing at the door. So she opens the door and says, hi Lee. And Lee says, is Juan Valdez here? And she says, no, Juan lives in the next apartment. Okay. Lee says, thank you, and goes on about his way. But because the way the patio apartments are laid out around the courtyard with these glass windows, She's seeing Lee Oswald come and go out of Juan Valdez's apartment all the time. Now, for those of you who have read Dr. Mary's Monkey, the name Juan Valdez is not a Colombian coffee. <laughs> <laughs> he is the guy that lives next door to these people. And he is the person who calls the police to report the smoke. Oh my God. Could I ask you all to turn off your phones, please? Excuse me. 
I'm not beating anybody up. I just I, I want us to be able to talk without uh, perfect disturbance. So um, they said, you know, Juan was kind of a strange guy. We knew him well because we lived next door. He would come over to our apartment to make phone calls to places like Havana in Miami. He said he didn't want to make these phone calls from his phone, but he'd be happy to pay us. And, he said, and no one says, hey, we were naive. It was a different time. Okay? But we would let him do this. He was quite good about paying for the things. And then he would have orchids shipped in. And he didn't want his orchids to expire in the heat, so he had them delivered to our address, not his. Which may be why Lee Oswald knocked on the wrong door. Okay. Owen said, that guy was so strange, he had NOPD officers coming out of his apartment in the middle of the night. He said he was up to so much stuff. He said, I don't know what he was up to, but it was so bad. And this is Owen Haas talking. He said, I wrote a letter to the FBI and saying, I don't know what's up with this guy, but you guys need to investigate this guy. And according to Owen, they did nothing. Okay? They were given a lead on a guy who was doing something extremely suspicious, which I'll talk about in a second, with the guy about to be accused of murdering the president, and they did nothing. Here comes the next nugget on this one. It said, whenever Lee would go in to Juan's apartment, they could hear the toilet being flushed. 25 to 30 times in a row. I said, you, you sure about that? And they said, our bedroom shared a wall with Juan Valdez's bathroom. And the pipes were in the wall. So every time Juan Valdez flushed the toilet, we heard it running through our headboards of our bedroom. So I'm very sure. I said, well, how many times did this happen? Not like once or twice? They said, no, it was every night. <coughs> for over a month. Well, y'all, some of you have read Me and Lee by Judith Berry Baker. Yes. Now you know about the game that they're doing with the mice and the tumors, and they're going over to David Ferry's apartment, and they're killing the mice, and they're cutting out the tumors, and they're dropping the tumors in a blender, and they're making a puree out of it. And then they're filtering it and pouring the sauce into test tubes and making slides. And then Judy is putting all of that into her lunchbox, going standing out on Toledano Avenue, getting the Louisiana Avenue bus, taking it up to St. Charles Avenue, and walking into Mary Sherman's apartment and depositing the lunchbox so that Mary can look at it with her oil immersion microscope and study what they're doing. Now, as you know from Judy's book, she very clearly says that Alton Oshner Sr. is in charge of this project. And Alton Oshner says, well, 50 mice a day was good last week, but now we need 100 mice a day. Now we need 200 mice a day. Now we need 500 mice a day. So in the latter part of the summer, and I'm talking late July, August, a lot of material was a lot of mice were being killed at David Ferry's apartment, and a lot of tumor material was being brought over to Mary Sherman's apartment. What do you do with it then? You flush it down the toilet. And Mary Sherman, chairperson of the pathology committee of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, is not going to stand there at the toilet and flush the stuff down. They have somebody else to handle that. Lee Oswald is picking up the stuff out of Mary's apartment, bringing it into Juan Valdez's apartment, and they are disposing it. So I'm talking to this Owen Hawes guy, and I said, you know, the Juan Valdez guy, I said, I want to tell you a story about him. One day my phone rang, and it was a fellow by the name of Frank Hayward. Okay? Frank Hayward was one of the NOPD homicide detectives that investigated the case in 64. Okay. And Frank says, oh, by the way, before we get too far in this, I want to remind you that I'm also the guy that arrested Lee Harvey Oswald on Canal Street on August 9th, 1963. Okay. 
says, so I got a fair amount of history with this story, and but I want to talk to you about this Juan Valdez company. He said, because we didn't know who killed Mary, but there was something wrong with Juan Valdez. He said, just as my hunch as a homicide detective, I wanted to arrest him and squeeze him. They wouldn't let me. I didn't have enough evidence to make him stick. So I said, oh, and I said, you remember Juan Valdez, you know, Juan Valdez is the guy who says he smelled the smoke through the ventilation system. And Owen says, oh yeah, I meant to talk to you about that. I'm a building engineer. There was no ventilation system in the patio apartments. <laughs> there were window units, kind of like you see at the motels, okay? And they were all on the exterior wall of this horseshoe-shaped building. And Juan Valdez lived on the second floor, closest to St. Charles, on the downtown side of the building. Mary lived on the second floor, in the middle, all the way in the back. In other words, there are no two apartments that are further apart from each other in the patio apartments than Mary Sherman's and Juan Valdez. Therefore, he is the least likely person in the entire complex to smell smoke, unless he's wandering around at 4 o'clock in the morning. So there's something wrong with Juan Valdez. In fact, this morning, and this is why I mean when stuff keeps coming to me, this woman says, I was a nurse on Canal Street, and one day Juan Valdez comes stumbling into our office. He was really sick. We took a blood panel on him. We looked at his blood. His blood was like really crazy. We don't know what was the matter with it. But we tried to contact him, and we couldn't find him. And he just disappeared. We even wrote a registered letter to him and it came back as undeliverable. So, where did Juan Valdez go? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but Donnelly Keith, who is a professional journalist in New Orleans, interviewed about 120 people looking for Juan Valdez. We don't know where he is. Then Owen says, remember Owen? I'm talking Owen here, okay? Mm -hmm. Owen says, you know, the other thing about Juan Valdez, he said, you know about this burglary of Mary Sherman's apartment? I mean, not when she was murdered, but there was a burglary earlier. I said, yeah, I read about it in the newspaper. They said six months earlier. He said, well, he said, my name's in that report, and they had me doing things that I did not do. And he said, I'm, I'm kind of annoyed to have my name in a police report saying I did things that I, I didn't do. He said, I can only, my only guess is that Juan Valdez did this. And he told the police that I saw this and I saw that, or he was telling them that he was me or, or whatever. And I said, Owen, how do you know your name is in that police report? <laughs> he said, oh, i got a copy right here. Oh my God. Would you like to see it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to see it. Thank you very much. And so he sends it to me. Now, here is the point. The, the newspaper said it was six months before Mary's murder. Well, today is the 50th anniversary, July 21st. Six months would be January 21st. The date of the incident is August 31st, 1963. Okay. Now, initially, that date would have meant as little to me as it probably means to you at the moment. But I edited Judith Berry Baker's book, Me and Lee, and I had to build a timeline of every single thing that she did that had anything to do with cancer or with Oswald. <coughs> and what I realized in there was there is this story that comes out of the Garrison investigation about Clinton, Louisiana. There is a town called Jackson, Louisiana. It has nothing to do with Jackson, Mississippi. It's a very small town. You could throw a frisbee through it. But they have a mental hospital up there called the East Louisiana State Mental Hospital. Some people call it Elms for short. Okay. It is basically a hospital for the criminally insane. And because of that, they have a lot of security around this hospital. You can't just wander in and wander out. Okay. Down the road from Jackson is Clinton in, in 
In other states, they would call it the county seat. You know, it's, of course, the parish seat of East Feliciana Parish. And what was going on in New Orleans with this laboratory that Judy was working on is that they were injecting the mice with cancer-causing monkey viruses, cutting out the tumors, and re-exposing the tumors to radiation to make them more lethal and to make them grow faster. And so they killed thousands of mice. And then they started testing it on monkeys. They started off with marmosets, South American monkeys. All right, they killed them. Then they started trading up the evolutionary ladder to African green monkeys, which were way more expensive. And they, they pretty much wiped out Tulane's supply of them. Tulane had to resupply uh, African green monkeys during the summer of 63. And that's actually in the uh, Times Picayune. The point is, the final step on this biological weapon was to test it on a human. So where do you get a human that you can kill and nobody will miss? How about death row at Angola Penitentiary, which is right down the road from Clinton and Jackson? So that's what the, the, the game is. They're going to take the biological weapon up there. They're going to sneak onto the grounds. They're going to put the test into the human. And then they're going to see if it works. Okay? So they got all this set up. They're going to, they've got it set up so that the guy is going to be released from death row in Angola. He's going to be brought over to Jackson. And they're going to wait in Clinton until the van is on the road. And then the black Cadillac is going to get in line behind the van with the seal on it. And it's going to go inside the um, mental hospital so they can inject it on it. They set this up for August 29th, but they forgot to read the newspaper. Because on August 28th, Martin Luther King did his I Have a Dream speech. And the Congress of Racial Equality, which is a national organization operated out of the University of Chicago, but with a headquarters in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, set up a black voter registration drive in Clinton, Louisiana for August 29th. So I want you to picture the scene. This is a square in front of a courthouse that is normally deserted on a hot August afternoon. But this August afternoon, we have a line of blacks waiting to register to vote. We have a bunch of angry Ku Klux Klan kind of whites on the other side of the square with their arms crossed and being very unhappy about what they're seeing. And we've got this poor guy with a badge on in the middle, hoping there's not going to be proper trouble, okay? His name's John Manchester. Now, into this scene drives a black Cadillac. <laughs> hey, Joe, you know who these people are? You know? So, John Manchester goes over to the black Cadillac and says, may I see your ID, please? And the man says, yes, I am Clay Shaw from the International Trade. I'll tell you how we, how we know about this story in a second. The guy in the back seat gets out. He's kind of a smart aleck. He wants to know if he can register because he's white, even though he doesn't live in the area. So he goes and gets a line with blacks, and he tries to register. And he signs in. He signs in his name, Lee Harvey Oswald, on the register. So we've got one car with Clay Shaw driving. Lee Harvey Oswald in the back seat, and some guy with the big eyebrows and a red hip wig on in the front seat. That's David Ferry, in case you don't recognize him. They also have an employee of the hospital that they have picked up, so that when they get in line behind the van, they've got an employee, and they all get waved in at the same time. You know, Clay Shaw's a big, dignified-looking guy. He's like a judge or something. You know, black Cadillac, all this authority stuff. That's August 29th. 
<coughs> I'm talking to you about August 31st, right? Two days later? Well, what happens is they want to know, did the biological weapon work? Did the cancer kick in? They had to do a blood test on the patient 48 hours later. And not any old blood test. This is a specialized blood tritation test, which is, was taught to Judith Berry Baker at the Roswell Park Memorial Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. She was trained up there. So she's one of a handful of people in the entire country that knows how to do this test. And remember when Garrison around, <coughs> was around, he, he had this theory that they were doing all this stuff at the mental hospital to make Oswald look crazy. Well, in 63, the largest mental hospital in Louisiana was in Mandeville, right? Not very far from New Orleans. Jackson, Louisiana is three and a half hours on today's roads. One way. So you got to go up about four hours, back about four hours, and you got about two hours of doing stuff up there. So this is a full day project. And now they need to take Judy back up to the mental hospital. She puts on a little nurse's uniform so she'll look like she works there. And Lee Oswald drives her in a green Kaiser. One of those 1940s kind of cars that are no longer around. Okay? From New Orleans all the way up to Jackson. And by the way, by this point in time, Lee has known that he is being set up as a patsy in the Kennedy assassination for over a month. Okay? He told Judy on July 29th, and that's kind of an annoying get sidetracked on that. But the point is, Lee is leaving a breadcrumb trail, which is why he go 